Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is going to be part two of my series on the murder of Cleopatra. Uh, there's going to, it's a 10 part series, and this is going to be about Caesar and Cleopatra. Uh, now, you know that I have been, um, have been watching the new Netflix series called Queen Cleopatra. So I'm doing some comparisons to that, uh, that uh, series on Netflix. It's a four part series. I think it's pretty, pretty dreadful. Um, and I have, this is my book on, on, Cleopatra, The Murder of Cleopatra. This was published in 2013. Um, uh, in 2004, I did a documentary for um, Discovery Channel. It's called The Mysterious Death of Cleopatra. And that's when I got rid of the cobra from history. Uh, and then after that, I was fascinated with what I thought was not a suicide, but a murder that she had been executed. And there was so much more of her life and death I wanted to address that I wrote this book. And this came out. In 2013. Um, now we have this um, <clears throat> version of history, which is pretty much an atrocity. And I'm going to point out some more of those atrocities in this in this video. So now I also want to mention to you that uh, this is a long book. There's a lot of information in here. What I'm going to do is be, I'm going to pick out three main topics and I'm going to read little excerpts from them uh, to point out three things that are completely off in history and a lot, and I believe in a lot of these, um, in certain books and certain people's uh, uh, retelling of the history, I think isn't quite right. Now I want to say again, um, I base everything on evidence and evidence is sometimes, it can be the writings of the ancient historians, but a lot of times they <laughs> fabricate stuff that makes no sense to make a better story. Um, so sometimes there's, I, have, I have had to look at physical evidence or um, behavioral evidence, a whole bunch of different things put together, but I'm going to explain what I'm, where I get my thinking from. So it's not just an opinion. I am giving a determination based on something and that will be explained. All right. So this is going to be about Caesar and Cleopatra. Now this is of course the, uh, from, from this is, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, she made quite a, quite a decent, uh, I have to say, she made quite a decent Cleopatra. I didn't object. Of course, it was fictionalized and all that, but it was quite lovely. Uh, and there is a lot. It's well, Let me put it this way. It's very important to understand Cleopatra, to understand the choices she made, because uh, she was a brilliant, brilliant person. And she was in a very difficult situation. Uh, anybody who was a Ptolemy at the time and was trying to ascend the throne or ascend to the throne and became the Pharaoh and was trying to deal with their country and some of the, um, the Alexandrian elite who ran a lot of things and some of the priests and the mob and also uh, dealing with Rome who was, was, was eating up that area, uh, encroaching on everybody and taking over, it wasn't easy. Uh, so you had to be smart you had to be ruthless and you had to be lucky. <laughs> she, I'd say Cleopatra was at least two out of three. She didn't have the greatest luck in her reign, um, but she did try. She really did. So I'm going to look at her personality and how she, when she became queen, I'm going to look at her meeting when she first met uh, Caesar at the palace and quite a fanciful tale is told of that. And I'm also going to talk about, um, the baby, she's the baby Caesarian that when she was with Caesar, she became pregnant and had a baby. And what does Caesarian mean? And is the is there is it true what they say about Caesarian? Okay. And who Caesarian actually is. All right. So let's get to it. All right. Now, Cleopatra. She was quite something. In, in chapter seven of my book. Um, I talk about how Cleopatra becomes queen. Cleopatra the seventh becomes the queen. Now, as I point out, she didn't just roll in and have a pleasant time. Uh, you know, sometimes we think in modern day when you, you know, look at some of the queens, you know, maybe not so far back in history, they might have had a nice long reign and a pretty good amount of support. That wasn't what was happening in Egypt. The Ptolemies had been there a while, but it was ruthless and they were ruthless. So, it was, yeah, you'll see. Uh, Cleopatra inherited an array of problems when she was born into the Ptolemaic dynasty in 69 BCE. 
Uh, she had a reported fool for a father. Oh, if you're watching the documentary, Queen Cleopatra, <laughs> they present him as being a great ruler. And when he's dying and he turns over uh, the, the dynasty to Cleopatra, she's crying by her father's side. Oh my gosh, daddy, daddy. And then he says to her, uh, you're the only one I trust. <laughs> you're the only one I trust to keep the kingdom going, you know, to keep Egypt going the way I've made it, the way I've done it in all my wonderful ways. Nonsense. The guy was a fool. <laughs> he was a fool. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. And she was like, bye, daddy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she had a rep reported fool for a father, not one of the more accomplished or acclaimed Ptolemies in the long line of rulers. This was a country on the verge of being gobbled up by Rome. And there are far too many siblings on the ver uh, that were fighting for the throne to have a good chance of winning it. So she had five siblings. At least I think that's what the number is. Um, and she wasn't at the top of the list. So she had two older sisters who could claim it first. She had two brothers who were younger than her, but they were boys. Uh, and she had a younger, very aggressive sister. Hmm very aggressive younger sister, um, who couldn't be discounted as a threat. So that she won out is a, as a testament to her, her aggressiveness and astuteness, neither of which seemed to be inherited from her father. <laughs> so yeah, her father, Alete, Alete, I can't pronounce the guy's name, Aletes? Alete, I think it's Aletes. Um, sorry, I didn't study that pronunciation. I never actually had to say it out loud. Um, or maybe it's Aletes. Hmm. Um, he, he, he was not chosen by his father to ascend the throne. What happened was the other couple <laughs> that had been on the throne got murdered. And so they, and they left no children. So the, the, the so then they had to look at the Alexandrian elites had to pick another one of those Ptolemies and they said, okay, him. <laughs> and they weren't thrilled, but that's what they had. All they could hope for is that he wouldn't be a total failure. So the, the, the pharaohs held great power, but not alone. They had the Alexandria elite. They had the high priests. They had many administrators who kept the country afloat. Okay. Um, and a lot of times they were all fighting. Uh, they might have been hiding out when other people were trying to assassinate them. So they weren't even always in the country and they left somebody to run the country. Even Cleopatra did that. She did that a couple of times to leave the country. And she went, when she went off to Rome, for example, with Caesar, she was gone a long time. She wasn't there. She had those people running the country. All right. So uh, Cleopatra's father wasn't ignorant of the fact that the Alexandrian mob had put him into power and they could remove him. So he had to have some, pat, some, some strength. And so what he did was he basically took help from Rome. Um, he was kind of Rome's puppet at that point. Uh, he bribed officials on regular occasions, the Roman officials, because um, he had a lot of money and he taxed a lot of people and he kept going. All right. So he bribed people and that's how he stayed in power. And the Romans didn't mind having him as somebody they could control. Um, and so they did. Now, eventually what happened, they made, he made a big mistake. He gave away Cyprus and that kind of messed him up because what happened then is it was a huge loss to Egypt. And Rome was able to assert its military power over the Egyptian territory. And the Alexandrians were not happy about that. So what they did was the mob came after him. He had to flee the country. And he left, he put Egypt in the hands of his firstborn daughter, uh, uh, Berenike. That's the fourth, Berenike the fourth. All right. I don't know what happened to his wife. She seems to be dead. Maybe he killed her. <laughs> Hard to know. Um, but he left her there. Um, and they, the, the Alexandrians said she can't rule alone, so they gave her a husband, and she didn't like him, so she strangled him. See, this is the Ptolemies for you. So now, Baraniki lasted uh, three years, and good old dad had some advantage because the Romans did sort of like him. You gave him Cyprus, you know what I mean? So anyway, they backed him. He re-entered Egypt, and when he re-entered Egypt, he murdered her as all the Ptolemies do. So now she's out of the picture and he's back in the picture. All right. But he didn't have a co-regent because his wife, for whatever reasons, is dead. Remember, there's a lot of history, which is it's a very, um, there's a lot of facts missing, shall we say. 
We just don't know, or that, or that was written down one day, but never, never stayed for the future. So he appointed um, Cleopatra the seventh as his co-regent. Um, now, oh, there's an elder Cleopatra, by the way. So there were three girls, and she was the third girl. But I don't know what happened to the second girl. She disappeared. Maybe she died or something. Maybe they killed her too. Um, so Cleopatra took became the co-regent. Uh, she had two younger, the two younger brothers and the younger sister. But the two younger brothers um, were quite much younger. Uh, so the oldest uh, oldest one was eight years younger. All right. So now she was ruling. Uh, with him. And then four years later, when she was 18, Cleopatra was 18, he died. Um, so now she became Pharaoh. And Ptolemy VIII, that was the one who now that she was 18, he'd be 10. He was appointed to rule with her and she didn't particularly appreciate that, but she was stuck with him. Okay. So she kind of, um, what did she ousted him? She said, take a hike. Now, mind you, he had handlers people who controlled him, but somehow she managed to oust him. She ruled alone for 18 months. But then the people, she, <laughs> the guys that controlled the kid um, came back and uh, attacked her. So she ended up having to run the country. So she left the country. All right. So now she's out of the country and he's in the country and he's got his people working with him. All right. So now she's, she's in Syria. So, then, then she got she got her army together. She rolls back with her army, and she makes her way there. And um, she has a fight, but it didn't go well for Cleopatra. So he ended up winning, and so she was sort of still not in the picture. Now, meanwhile, Julius Caesar was fighting all over this with everybody in Rome to take keep his place. So that's a whole other story. But eventually, he comes to Egypt. All right, and when he gets to Egypt. The, the brother is sort of sort of running things, you know, and um, the brother pisses him off because the brother uh, and his people, you know, the people handling killed off um, a Pompey who was fighting with Caesar, but it was still a Roman and he was pissed off that that happened. Then they cut his head off and sent it over to Caesar and he didn't appreciate it terribly, terribly much. So he didn't he can't say he liked that kid. All right. So he wasn't happy with the young boy who's 10 and of course, and whoever's behind him, you know, the puppeteers. All right. So meanwhile, <laughs> we have Cleopatra trying to get back in to the country. And here's where this very fanciful story of the rug comes up. Now, what happens is this story, if you, if you watch, uh, this is, this is from, this is from, the, the famous movie, you know, with Elizabeth Taylor. And she is brought, what happens is she's out of the country. She needs to get into the country to see Caesar. So she snuck into the country. Now, let me, let me read you some, just a couple versions of it. Now, Cassius Dio is one of the better writers because he doesn't embellish to the extent of Plutarch. Plutarch, I call him the damn brown of his time. So he wrote a simple thing. This is what Cassius Dio said. She requested permission to go before Caesar. And when she received it, she put on her finery so as to appear to him stately and pitiable at the same time. Once she had devised the perfect look, she entered the city for she had been outside it and approached the palace at night, keeping her arrival a secret from Ptolemy. That's her, the brother, right? Now, Plutarch always wanted to make it more dramatic. He said, she took a small boat and one, and one only of her confidants. Uh, Apollodorus, the Sicilian, along with her, and in the dusk of the evening landed near the palace. She was at a loss how to get in undiscovered till she thought of putting herself in a coverlet of a bed and lying at length while Apollodorus tied up the bedding and carried it on his back through the gates to Caesar's apartment. Caesar was first captivated by Cleopatra's bold wit and afterwards was overcome by her charm, and then he made a reconciliation between uh, her and her brother. All right. <laughs> now, it was depicted as a rug. And many, many times over, it's called a rug, right? So, but others say it's a bag, like a big, huge bag, like, I don't know, like a laundry bag. Um, and in the show, in the, in the, in the Netflix one, uh, they have her coming in a, in a bag and the guy's carrying her in this bag. And then he, 
<laughs> he comes in and then they open up the bag and she pops out, you know. Uh, but, but in the story, um, uh, as far as uh, Elizabeth Taylor thing goes, she rolls, she rolls out of the bag and qu makes qu quite an appearance. So here she is. She's like rolled out of the bag. She, I mean, sorry, the, the, the rug. He, the rug is unrolled and then she rolls out and she's like, ta-da. Okay. And it, so, uh, so the rug is not so much talked about today. Stacey Schiff, uh, she is one that wrote Cleopatra Life. She does the bag thing. And Netflix does the bag thing. <laughs> But but the whole thing is ridiculous, absolutely ludicrous. She didn't roll out of anything. And this, I it, it just doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to tell you why. All right. How did this really work? Okay. She was outside of Rome, outside of uh, Alexandria, and she needed to get there. She needed to see, uh, she needed to see Caesar. Okay. Now, mind you, she had been um, writing back and forth to Caesar. They were in communications, okay, uh, about her coming back. So it's, I says here in the book, there's evidence in the literature, and this can be backed up by logic, that she did not need to go to quite so covert, covert lengths to get an audience with Caesar and Alexandria. She had been communicating with him from her post over the border at Pelusium, shortly before sneaking past Achilles and heading toward Alexandria, she had sent word to Caesar that she was coming or he had sent word to her telling her to come. Either way, it was no surprise that Cleopatra was going to arrive in the harbor that night. So there were people, the communications were going back and forth. Here she, she's coming. This is, this is a Pharaoh that's coming to see him. So while, while Cleopatra was taking a risk, she had to be concerned that some of her brother's supporters could get wind she was coming. So there's a little bit of danger there. That could be violence against her and the people she was coming with. Uh, she also had to worry about the vol volatile uh, Alexandrians who might also not wish her there. However, Caesar was installed in Alexandria with two legions, which was not necessarily a lot for going to huge battle, but those legions numbered over 3,000 men and they reported to Caesar. He also had 800 cavalry that served as his bodyguard. 800 cavalry that were his bodyguard. Okay, so... Now, the palace is on the harbor, relatively short walk from the docks. She would not even actually need to get from a bigger ship to a smaller boat because a ship could pull in. However, she might have, right? And then she would be brought to the palace. Regardless of how she came on shore, I find it hard to believe that Caesar would not have made arrangements for her to arrive in one piece. No doubt she was met, escorted, possibly with a solid flanking of men about her. Maybe she could put a shawl over her head but she entered the palace and stood before Caesar. I'm quite confident that she looked like this when she arrived, uh, that she was ravishing to look at. She looked him directly in the eye, defiant, proud, strong. She would be queen. She's a queen for God's sakes. She's not a rug rat, <laughs> literally a rug rat, right? She's not. Now, let me point this out. This is what's so stupid about the, the whole thing about the, uh, the rug or the bag. In these movies and the depictions in the documentary, the guy comes to the door essentially goes knock knock, and Caesar's in there with like like a couple guys, and they're like, "What is it?" And then they open, I've got something for you, and they open up the door, and a guy comes in with a rug or a bag over his shoulder, and they go, "Oh, what you got there?" Now I'm sorry, I don't know who who the heck is the guy coming to the door bringing a rug or, or a bag. Why would any, why would, why would Caesar, who is who he is, allow some, anybody to show up at where he's at, not be checked out, not have somebody check the bag or the rug way far away from him, just in case inside that is something to kill him. You know, they're in the middle of a war for God's sakes. He's not, he's not just gonna allow somebody to knock on his door and come and say, oh, here's her, let me show you this rug. He doesn't need a rug and he doesn't need a bag. <laughs> so it's stupid. Stupid. And yet this story goes on. Drives me crazy. When makes much more sense in her communications, like she plans to come. He knows she's coming. He sends up people down to meet her and brings her into the palace. And she, and then she sees him not as some idiot teenager rolling out of anything or crawling out of a bag. And mind you, if you're rolled up in a rug or in a bag on a 
on a sh boat being put there and carried, when you get out of that, you don't look so good. You know, your hair is like this and, you know, you're sweating and maybe you suffocate in the darn bag or the, the <laughs> and the rug. What queen is going to do that? That's nonsense. So she came and walked in the door and he was expecting her. So none of this overdramatical crap. And that's how they met. And he, at that point, was dealing with this um, problem of the two of them. He had, now he had, he had Cleopatra, who was 21 at that time, her brother, who was 13, brothers, an annoying little pain in the butt. And he's, but he's got his people and he is, he is a co-regent and he's got Cleopatra who is older, smarter and every, and not bad looking, you know? <laughs> so he's got the choice. What do you do with these two? So anyway, he kind of installed both of them. It's like he put them together and said, stay here as he was fighting this war. And this went on for like four months. Okay. Um, so Cleopatra was like shut up in the palace pretty much with her, her brother, Yippee. And I'm sure he wasn't too thrilled about it either. And so they, but they were stuck there while things were going on uh, and Caesar would come and go. And yes, they hooked up Caesar and Cleopatra hooked up. Why not? He saw her as a, uh, you know, think about what he's getting out of this. He sees her as a, first of all, attractive, but also smart and somebody who can, who can rule Egypt and he can deal with her just like he did her father. And he doesn't have to deal with a little petulant child, brother, the 13 year old with the people behind him. So it worked. He's working. He's thinking this might work out, you know, in the future. I want to go back to Rome. She can take care of Egypt for me. So meanwhile, she's going, hmm, what can I do to ensure that I'm totally, I totally lock Caesar in. She's smart. And of course, pregnancy is one of the things that can happen. So the story goes is that she got pregnant during that time by Caesar. And eventually she had this baby. And the, this is kind of funny. It just amuses the heck out of me. This is the baby that they show in the beginning of the, the, the uh, document. Well, when she first has the baby. Uh, and remember, they have a whole race thing going here. She's supposedly biracial. Um, and dark skinned. And now she has the, you know, she's having this baby, which if she's with a guy who's that color, it, yeah, maybe they're in between color. But later on, here, here he is with the child. I'm like, well, whoa, whoa, what happened here? <laughs> that child is more, is darker than the mom. I'm going to say, Caesar, that ain't your kid. That ain't your kid. <laughs> it's like, you, this is so silly. So, at any rate, she had a Cleopatra who was not, not dark skinned who was a Greek, which I explained in the first part. She's a Greek. She has, she's either pale skinned or olive skinned, whatever. And, and she hooks up a Caesar who is also similar. They will have a similar looking child. There is, however, a problem. I do not believe that the baby, Caesarian, which she named after Caesar, was Caesar's child. And it's funny, nobody has ever discussed this issue, which I find amazing, because we're talking about a very clever, very clever queen who wants to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Let me explain why I think it's not his child. All right. Now, so she's cooped up in the palace with, with her brother, and then she's having sex with, you know, Caesar. Um, and there's no DNA in those days, so there's no way he'd know it was his kid. Um, and you know, when the child is born, as long as it basically looks like a baby, that's a similar color. You think, okay, that could be the baby. Um, now may maybe when the baby grows older, you, you, you know, the, the guy might look at the kid and go, it doesn't really look like me. <laughs> then you might notice maybe it's not mine, but those were the old days, you know? So anyway, we can't know if the child was Caesar's now, now clearly she's, you know, who would she get pregnant by if it wasn't Caesar? You know, uh, she has to pick somebody who is not a Nubian because then the child would be darker skinned. So she would have to pick somebody that it would work with if it's not Caesar's. And you're going to say, why not Caesar? Why, why wouldn't it be his kid? I'll explain. We don't know if it's Caesar's through physical appearance. That's impossible to know. At the time, he was 52 years old. And we don't know if he can get women pregnant. We don't. Why do we not know this? Uh He's not too old to sire a child. Many men can have, you know, get women pregnant into their 90s, you know, but not every man is capable, for example. He could have issues 
not be just simply have issues. He could be, he could have prostate issues and not be that, you know, dynamic anymore. <laughs> he could, but he could be a stallion in bed. We don't know, but we don't know whether he can actually produce children. Now I'll tell you why. He was only ever to know, ever known to have fathered one child, Julia, some 36 years earlier with his first wife. And mind you, he did seem to play the field and have a good time. Uh, one of the statements made about him was that he's every man's, every woman's man and every man's woman. Not sure what that quite means back in the day, but he got around. And so he had one child with, with his first wife 36 years prior. He had no children with his second or third wives. Why not? Nor was he ever known to have any other children by any of the women he had countless affairs with. He never had a son. And it would be odd for a man not to want to advertise a son if he actually had one. Right. Maybe even if they're illegitimate, he'd be happy to say that's my kid because he doesn't. You know, he has only one daughter. All right. But. In four decades, Caesar does not link himself to one male heir. All right. Now, when Cleopatra has his child, and I put quotes around that, he allows her to use the name Caesarian. But here's, here's the thing. He does not brag about his son, nor does he put the child in his will. Okay. Now, if this is his actual son, the only son, and he's hooked up with her, why not have Caesarian be his son to rule Egypt, he can rule, you know, he's rule already ruling Rome. If he hangs around long enough, maybe his son will grow up and, uh, and rule Egypt at the same time, whatever. But why wouldn't he want his son to rule Egypt? It's more control, but he never puts him in the will. And he doesn't pray to him around Rome like they make it look like in the Netflix thing. It's like he's, he's willing to have her say it's his son, but he's not willing to brag about it himself or put him in the will. All right. Now, so I'm going to assume that uh, Caesar may have a pretty good clue that he couldn't get women pregnant. And so when she got pregnant, he's like, <laughs> sure, but he's willing to play the game. I'll go along with it. You know, it'll make me look more virile. And and I don't care. You know, I can tell people, yeah, I got her pregnant, but he's just not going to make that kid his heir to the empire. All right. So then what happens? How did he, she get pregnant then if it wasn't by Caesar? Well, who was she cooped up in the old palace with? 13-year-old bored brother. Day after day after day. And she's all, the brother is her husband, you know. And the Ptolemies had no problem with incest. So if she, being a smart woman, would she take the chance when she's, if she knows Caesar doesn't have any, he's like only one daughter in all those years. Is she going to take the chance that during those four months, Remember, she's only going to be able to get pregnant a very small period of time each month. And he may not be around. He's, he's, he's fighting in battle. He's busy. I don't know. It's not like he came home every night and had sex with her, you know. So how many times he had sex during the four months is questionable. So she would have to be really rolling the dice that even if he could get her pregnant, it would happen in the four months. But she already knew he only had one daughter and no kids for decades. So I'm going to say she was not going to leave everything to chance. She had a brother, which was her husband, and incest is okay. And I'm sure he is not going to object to a little fun. <laughs> you know, he's a teen boy. I'm sure he wouldn't mind having sex with his sister. And I'm pretty sure that they could do it over and over and over again until she got pregnant. My guess is Caesarian is really Ptolemy the eighth's son. So... That's how she, I think that's how she planned it. So now, and, and Julius Caesar did not object. So now she thought, okay, I've got something more to tie me to Rome, to tie me to Caesar. And, and then, oh, and then of course, <laughs> the, the, the brother goes to some battle and he ends up drowning in a river. And then the younger brother, he just ends up dying of maybe a disease. Maybe he got poisoned. So now her brothers are gone. Only person left is that sister, um, which is going to have to deal with their sin away uh, later. Um, and she does, she does have, uh, she does deal with a sin away, and uh, sin away is taken away by Caesar and imprisoned. And then, the, then the, the story changes a little bit later because he was supposed to kill her off, and he didn't, and he put her on an island, and and eventually Cleopatra got her killed off. So 
she wanted to be the one and only ruler with the, the heir, her own heir, which is her own son, to co-regent, and that, that son be the son of Julius Caesar, so she would have that, that connection. Uh, and it might have worked really, really well, except that Caesar was assassinated. So what happened after Caesar gets assassinated? Why did Caesar get assassinated? All right, so in part three, I will be talking about Antony and Cleopatra because then she hooked up with Antony, but there's a, there was a reason she ended up hooking up with him. And Antony, I believe had a part to play in the death of Caesar, although that's not written into history either, but I believe the evidence supports that. So I will be getting into the relationship between Antony and Cleopatra, why, why they got together and what it was going to do for both of them. So that will be part three. I hope you will join me for that. And if you like this uh, series, please do like and subscribe. And the, the playlist is The Murder of Cleopatra. So if you come in on the series on some part and you haven't seen the others, please go check them out so you can understand how it goes. And I also recommend my book. It's, on, it's, on, it's in the um, link below uh, in the description. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, you can download it on Kindle um, because this will give you a much more thorough understanding of everything that I'm saying with all the other uh, more historical facts and the sources that I got these things from are all in the book um, and the bibliography and in the footnotes. So you can thoroughly understand. And of course you can always supplement that. And I do recommend books to supplement your understanding of Egypt and just in general. But if you're going to get your history uh, from Netflix, it's not so good. And in, and in fact, a good portion of historians who have told the stories over and over just don't seem to look at logic here and, and the evidence. So the, the, the fact that she's still rolling out of rugs and, and <laughs> or jumping out of a bag, being smuggled in is nonsense. And why nobody questions how Caesarian just suddenly, oh my God, you know, a guy can't get anybody pregnant in 40 years, but four weeks with Cleopatra. Bingo. <laughs> Why does nobody look at this? And I think a lot is that there's a lot of repetition of the ancient historians and that's where it stops. Uh, and once in a while you'll get a documentary that will be, will try to change up something, but the Netflix documentary, unfortunately just tried <laughs> to change up things that weren't based on evidence. And so it's a lot of nonsense. So I don't recommend that, but you might want to look at it just to, just to see, <laughs> just to see it. Mm, it's something else. It's not getting good ratings. Let me put it that way. So next time, part three, Antony and Cleopatra. And I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.